I am Julie Ryder, the discoverer of the Montana Megaliths, which are all around you. The first question everyone asks me is, how did you do this? Always the first question, how did you do this? Where are they at? And I'll have to tell you that this was a whole lifetime of being prepared. So I was taken into Indian country a few years ago, taken to the head man of the Canyoncito Navajo. This man name is Leon Secatero, and he gathered the elders from the entire world into New Mexico in 1998. They came from the Incas, the Aztecs, the Mayans, the Samis, they came from Siberia, they came from New Zealand. They spoke the United Nations and then did ceremony that was predicted in their prophecies. And when they came into ceremony, they dismissed all of the Western mind, they call it. Not how you speak, not your language, but how you think. Because nothing could be translated into English. And they just confused everything. They didn't understand the language. So they asked them to speak to the outside of the circle, and on the inside of the circle, the indigenous elders just communicated perfectly with each other. And they began to realize that they all had the same legends, the same stories. They could even speak the same language, and they were very telepathic with each other. And during these ceremonies, they wrote the next calendars. You've heard of the Aztec calendar, the Mayan calendar? Han Butson was there. They rewrote the Mayan calendars for the next 500 years, for the next 5,000 years, depending on their own traditions. Leon Secatero, he'd been working on this for years, put together the Navajo calendar for the next 500 years. They each have different sequences of time. Years later, I was taken to Leon Secatero's home by a native woman, and we went out on the landscape to what they call the Holy Lands, all around his home in a very small reserve in New Mexico. And I touched a pictograph and I started talking about it. He leans over and says, you're the one we've dreamed of, come with me. And he took my husband, but bring your husband. Like, you have to bring your husband. So for, we went to the Navajo and went into ceremonies where they read the Anasazi pictographs. They're all about quantum physics, astrophysics, genetic engineering, the star nations. This man teaches quantum physicists. He teaches astroarchaeologists because they understand more. The indigenous people understand more than our scientists in many, many, many fields. It's been handed down through their generations for time, forever. Then I was taken at Leon Secretaro's home. I met Warren Redwing Ramey. He is a principal chief of the Southern Cherokee. We would sit up all night and talk. And he would tell me, he'd teach me and teach me and say, you must take this on to the next generation so that it doesn't pass away when we pass over. And one by one, different elders told me the same thing. Uh, Lakota sun dances, went to four Lakota sun dances, sun dances and ceremonies on the Blackfeet. The Nez Perce become my closest friends that I travel with them in the summer. And so I've been immersed into this um, indigenous world that understands a science and a spiritual belief system that is assisted me in my work now. Leon Secretario came here to Helena. Actually, it started by, he comes running to our car when we first arrived. He says, I've been waiting for you. We've had a vision. We, meaning the Elders Council, have had a vision. There will be a city of light in Helena, in Helena Montana. Helena, Montana. I go to Helena. So he came here, and I took him out to Hellgate Canyon to the Shaman Rock, which was the only site we knew at that time. Um, this was in 2008. And he touched the rocks and he started reading the star maps. He started reading, like they read prophecies of the future. And he looked at me and he says, this is what you will do. And I am. He passed away in 2008. So many of these elders that taught me would teach me so that the, the knowledge and the language was preserved. Because much of the next generation doesn't understand or want to know. So Red Wing Ramey, um, his 
grandfather died when he was seven. He was made a chief at 19, but they hid him. But he knows and understands things hidden from the Western mind, vast knowledge. Then we have the prophecies of Black Elk, the famous Lakota prophet. He wrote, actually, Neihart wrote the book where Elk, Black Elk says, all the Indian nations will fall apart, but at the end of days, the hoops will regather on the headwaters of the river that I'm standing on. But no one knew where he was standing. So I went and found Charlotte Black Elk, his granddaughter. And sure enough, he was standing on the Missouri River in, Lakota, in North Dakota. I was invited into a Native American elders conference. These elders had met North American tribes only. They had met for, I think mean, it was 35 years, once a year. And at these, at these gatherings, they gave prophecies. Their prophecies from the Hopi say that you're going to the house of Micah and tell the worlds to stop destroying underground, which meant underground nuclear testing. If in 10 years that doesn't happen, you start to teach the Western mind. You have to teach them to take care of the earth. So they held this big conference and invited Western people into it. Western mind, the language is difficult. They invited non-indigenous people, I guess that's the word, um, to participate in this conference. And when I got there, um, the others didn't show up, so I got to facilitate it. So I got to sit in, in meetings with these elders. And at the end of the conference, they all stood up and formed a circle, and they started chanting this. Our prophecies say, to the headwaters, they are coming by the thousands they are coming. By the tens of thousands, they are coming. To the headwaters of the Missouri, they are coming. Get ready, for they are coming. Their leaders will come first, and then they will come. And I truly believe at this moment, I am looking at the leaders that will step forward and facilitate the buildings of the new world, excuse me, the new earth, excuse me, delete that, the new earth, these communities of love and light where we take care of our children, where we grow our own food, that is happening. It will be happening. And we're the ones that will build that. So fast forward to 2012. Um, Leon told me to go find these cities, these ancient cities. I had no idea what he was talking about. But in 2012, I was in the Boulder Hot Springs, just relaxing, and I had this vision. I put on my clothes and just walked into the forest, and I found the Boulder Dolmen. Then on Valentine's Day in 2015, my husband, Bill, said, for Valentine's Day gift, I'm going to give you a dolmen. OK. So we went driving along. And here's this light shining through the mountain. And it was a warm day, no snow. So we put on our jackets and went and hiked, and we found Giant's Playground. We had no idea what it was except the fact that it looked like there had been giant stones stacked on top of each other. So we named it Giant's Playground, almost as a joke. Then in 2017, I started putting these pictures on the internet. I didn't know what I was doing, just this is interesting. In 2017, a man named Andrew Barker, he friends me and we start chatting and he's just fascinating and he's funny and he's witty and he knows a lot about dolmens. And we talked for on and off for three months. Then finally one day he messages me and says, Julie, I really like you. I can only, he said, I only work with people I like, I can afford it which we all could. I only work with people I like. He says, I own the most advanced technology in the world, satellite deep geoscans. We have just scanned Egypt and found 82 rooms, many of them larger than supermarkets, full of artifacts. This technology can go 3.7 miles under the ground, 
layer the images, just like you look at an MRI, and they can tell us what the artifacts are made out of within a sonometer. They can tell you out of the 123 Earth elements what that artifact is composed of with 100% accuracy. I thought about it, and I went to my source, and a number of people on the internet vetted him out and said, yeah, he's honest, this is the man. And so I said yes, and I gave him the GPS for Giant's Playground. Dr. Sam and I were there with the group yesterday, and he'll be showing you Giant's Playground. And he came back with, I'm bringing the entire team. You can't ask me questions. This is a research project. So I said, it's the middle of the winter. There's snow out there. You can't come for a few months. So how about if I give you 40 more coordinates? His answer to that was, they did a Skype presentation. So Andrew Barker is the businessman out in the world. He's also the world's expert on dolmens. Professor is the man that does the technology. So the professor came on a Skype presentation, and the first thing he said is, you have pyramids, pointed pyramids, step, truncated, conical, pre-pyramids and stuff we've never seen before anywhere else in the world. This is older. Then he said, you have the tallest standing block, intentionally constructed, the tallest standing block in the world, and the largest. Let me say that again. You have the largest standing stone block, and you have the tallest dolmen. So the largest standing stone block is 5,300 tons, and it's still standing up, and it's made from rock, actually geopolymer concrete, but rock that is not from that area. They brought the rock in. Then he said you have the tallest dolmen in the world, which is evergreen at Giant's Playground, which Dr. Sam will be showing you. His initial conclusion was that what is above Giant's Playground is over 72,000 years old as compared with what's underground, under the ocean, under the, uh, underground in Egypt, underground, whatever, everywhere else in the world. This is the oldest site they have scanned so far. I truly believe that Gornishoria in Russia is about the same age. So eventually, through an email, a there's a place called Megalithic Portal, and you can put your stuff on there, and then you can email anyone else, and you, they don't give you your name, your address, your phone number, and your email. You can talk to people all over the world through a certain code system. And I went on that site, and I found pictures of the Montana Megaliths, and I thought, who in the world did this, right? So I messaged the man that put him up, and I said, like, this is Montana, I'm Julie Ryder. He said, oh, we've been looking for you. Do you understand what you've done? And I said, no, tell me. He said, I am the videographer for the country of Russia on ancient megalithic sites. You have found similar to what's called Gornashoria, which are huge, beautiful megalithic walls. He said, come to Russia. We'll make videos together. <laughs> and that was doing the Russia, Russia, Russia thing, and so no way. But we communicated for a while, and then all of a sudden he comes back and says, I have to withdraw the offer. The government has classified everything. They won't even allow me in there. But he sent me some pictures. He says, you cannot print these, but you can study them. This is a research project. I love the way that you, everything can happen under research, right? And so I started studying that, and he comes on and says, go find this, go find that. And I did. So he talks about this worldwide civilization destroyed by asteroids, floods, over and over and over. Okay. And Dr. Sam has given some interesting information, and he will present this to you, about how old stuff is based on the catastrophic events that um, destroyed it. Back to Giant's Playground. When Andrew Barker surveyed Giant's Playground, he said, you have such a variety in one place. So in Giant's Playground, there is the tallest dolmen in the world. It's 83 feet above ground level. There is a statue of a Buddha, exactly like the ones in Cambodia. In fact, how this was figured out 
was I took a picture, put it on my Facebook, and one of my friends in Cambodia, standing at Angkor Wat, takes a picture of the Buddha there and says, they're identical match. We have a robot. He's one of the smaller ones. We've since there found much larger robots, much, much larger. But there's a robot at Giant's Playground, and the left eye is a white sclera, a white eye, a perfectly round black pupil, and it lights up on the spring equinox when the sun hits it. And I found a number of these. You see the eyes light up when the sun comes up at a certain time, reaches a certain point, and the whole thing lights up. And the next day, you can't even find it. You have to be at that exact moment in time, because these are all set up to different um, movement of the earth, movement of the sun, astrological star systems. There's so much more research to do. Um, I could keep entire teams busy. We'll get there. At Giants, there's also a statue of Tartessia. She's considered the last queen of Atlantis. Big rondelles in her hair, those big like gear shifts in her hair. A very famous statue that was found in, under Spain in the early 1900s, and it's now in a museum in Spain. So we have a statue of Tartessia identified by Andrew Barker while he was here. He lives in Andalusia, Spain. This is one of his specialties. We have a second um, statue of Tartessia, which is on the head of Eagle Mount, a huge mountain that is 150 stories high, 1,500 feet, and it's carved into an eagle. And on the side of the head is a perfect statue of Tartessia. You can see her eyebrows. You can see her eyes, her nostrils. Next to her is a man who is lower than she is, which means that she is of higher rank than he is. And it's on her left side. And this man, you can see the hairs in his mustache. You can see the part in his hair. In a statue, 1,500 feet in the air on the side of the head of the eagle. I got ahead of myself. We have humongous cyclopean walls. Dr. Sam is going to show you pictures of one of the smaller ones. The larger ones are almost impossible to get to, although I can see them. We can see them with binoculars. We can see them in um, Google Earth. Know where some of them are. But to climb it would be, for me, impossible at this moment. However, there are teams coming that plan on doing that next summer. For me, the most exciting thing is the temples. When the professor was giving us the Skype presentation, I stayed totally silent, and I turned the camera away from me because my son says I would never be a good poker player. I can't keep a straight face, and so I didn't let him see me. And at the very end of it, they kept talking about all this stuff, and I, I couldn't figure out what they wanted from me. And finally, the professor said, Julie, we know you're a very spiritual person, and we found the temple. He said, the temple. Artifacts are still intact. Well, I'm intrigued. <laughs> and he says, um, it's not accessible at this moment, covered with dirt, mud, scree trees. Okay. And so I said, so what is it that you need? What do you want? And basically, the agreement was that I would not give GPS coordinates to anybody else, any other team, that at this moment, I would not allow anyone in that had cell phones or I had an old camera that did not, was not hooked up to GPS. So no one got to come with GPS cameras. Uh, no one got to report it. They all s agreed with non-disclosure agreements. And the team kept on scanning. They spent a fortune. Okay. And finally, Andrew Barker made the announcement that, um, how did he say it? That these are raw, chaotic, ever surprising, and you'll see a pile of rocks and chaos, but out of that comes this beautiful, perfectly intact dolmen. This beautifully, perfectly intact um, statues of the ancient ancestors. But because we have in one place the statues that represent multiple current religions, 
Doesn't that tell you that we were all one people at one time? And hopefully we can become that again. So our goal is to protect this for the generations to come. The children and the children's children, they don't need to be dug up. We know what's under there. The tallest dolmen in Europe was, they tried to excavate it, it tumbled on them, it tumbled down. Because now, the mud and the dirt and the scree and the trees hold them in place. If they start digging down there, many of them will collapse, they'll be destroyed. So we hope this does not become a national park. And we as a community are going to have to figure out how we're going to protect this. Why I'm excited about the temples is that the professor said that there are markers that all point to the same place, and in the center of that is this temple. And I had no idea what he was talking about until one day um, I just had a knowing to look back in my files. I'd missed something. So I spent the morning going through all these files until I came to the Skype presentation. One of my friends had actually written the GPS coordinates. She saw him on the screen when he was showing us Google Earth, and she wrote down the GPS coordinates. We found the temple. And so if you look, it's on my website, it's on, in my book, there's a geosculpture of a mermaid. She's seven square miles, her eyes look right at that temple. There's huge edifices that point, like literally arrows, and they point to this temple. In my understanding, that is the healing center. There's crystals underneath it. I just know that intuitively. I found a second huge temple that has not been scanned. Okay. And I don't know what to think about it yet. Nothing like this has ever been found. And so how I work is that I ask the worldwide audience on my Facebook or whatever, what is this? What do you think? And I get back from them photographs, like, Julie, you're wrong. This is in Australia. They go, never been to Australia. Julie, you're wrong. This is in Russia. Never been there either, right? So they send me back the photographs that match and the data. And this one wonderful man actually does all the astrological alignments, sends me graphic designs. And I said, he first sent me, what was it, 20-something pages of calculations? And I go, uh-uh. If you can make me understand it, maybe three paragraphs, I'll print it. So he took my photographs and drew over them until it's very obvious what he's illustrating. Uh, the Amber's compass is set up to the star system Orion. It's a perfect match. And he's done a lot of these pictographs, a lot of the sites, and aligned them with what's happening in the stars. There's another man named Wayne Herschel. He wrote the most extraordinary book and he's got these beautiful illustrations where he shows you that Egypt is exactly aligned like the Milky Way galaxy. One temple, one pyramid represents each star, 180 degrees reversed. A man in Russia did the same thing. The dolmens in Russia line up exactly like the stars in the Milky Way galaxy, 180 degrees reversed. They just recently uh, cleaned out a temple in Egypt, and on the ceiling was the exact same pattern, the Milky Way galaxy. The indigenous people, most of them, say that they came from a certain star system. Like, we came from the Pleiades, the Dogan came from Syria, the uh, Chippewa Cree say they came from a star in the center of the Big Dipper. They came from different star systems, and these star systems are represented on the ground in these huge buildings, their calendars, in the dolmens, in the way the rocks are placed in the calendars, represent the star systems. It's all set up that way. I told Wayne Herschel that when we were ready, he could come. But we weren't ready yet, because we've only found, I mean, in Egypt, they pretty well found a lot of things, right? We are just beginning. When we start lining this up, he will come, and he has permission when the time is right. So. As many of you know, I've been extremely careful on who I allow to come here. I've been made offers from all over, major media, mass media, all over. And I just sense their energy. 
So for a long time, I have followed Dr. Sam's work. And just was fascinated by who he was, how kind he was, how he treated other people, how he presented his work. And so a um, few weeks ago, I was invited to travel with my Nez Perce friends. Every year they traveled the Chief Joseph Trail doing ceremonies all along. And I had known these women for over 20 years. And I got to travel with them. And so we went to the Bighorn Medicine Wheel in Wyoming. Many of you know of it. And in this Bighorn Medicine Wheel, because these are the indigenous elders, they just lift up the barricades, drive through. They have the nephews walk around the medicine wheel and tell everyone, no cell phones, no photographs, and please be quiet. We're doing ceremonies. And so they guard the perimeter when we go inside. So we're inside doing the ceremonies. And the woman's name is Janet Black Eagle. She's on my Facebook a lot. And Janet looks at me and says, Julie, make the impossible wish. First thing in my mind was, Dr. Sam comes. And a couple weeks later, he, called, he messages me, and he found some old email that he hadn't even seen that talked about the Montana Megalis. And he writes, and he says, I have read both websites, looked at every video. I'm coming to Helena. And I said, you know, it's really cold in October. I mean, usually it's really cold. Why don't you come in the spring? And he says, I'll be there October 12th and 13th. Join me if you wish. And so he came. A wish come true for me. And I think for all of us, when you understand who he is and what he's done. So I'm introducing Dr. I can't even say his name, Samir Osmanovich. I mean, I, I listened to so many videos trying to figure out how they pronounced it, and everybody pronounces it differently. So we're just going to call him Dr. Sam, and he's going to introduce himself. Thank you for coming. I know that as this community, this discovery is going to change everything. So let's do it in a good way. Thank you. Wonderful job. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate that. I want to extend my sincere respect and gratitude to Julie Ryder, her husband, and the crew around her. So my name is Dr. Sam Osmanagic. And for four years, I have been researching megaliths and pyramid sites around the world. I've authored 18 books about the ancient civilizations, translated into 17 languages. My PhD is about the Mayan pyramids. Four years later, I realized that I know so little, almost nothing. But I came to one conclusion. Almost everything they teach us about the ancient history is wrong. The origin of man, civilizations, and pyramids. So tonight, I'm taking you to the magic of archaeology. First, the megaliths. Megalithic circles. The best known, of course, is this one in southern England, and it is called the Stonehenge. Official archaeology and historians do not know who built it, when it was built. They are guessing 5,100 years. How did they do it? And what was the major purpose? Today, it's been damaged and reconstructed several times. 
And this is how it looks like from the air. Half of the megaliths are missing. But those who are here, blue stones, the smaller ones, and gray stones, they are huge, reaching 25 tons blue stones and 60 tons gray stones. And they quarry them in wells which is almost 200 miles away over the rivers, and lakes, and mountains, and valleys. From the construction standpoint of view, this was a huge effort. Encyclopedia Britannica, Wikipedia, and other non-scientific sites claim that it was built by the Neolithic tribes tribes do not have a social organization to move such massive megaliths. This is probably the original look of the Stonehenge. 30 vertical blocks and 30 horizontal. Let's do a little math. 30 plus 30, 60 megaliths. They form circles. Circle has 360 degrees. 60 times 360 equals 21,600. Very important number. If you analyze it, 216, you add them, equals 9. 9, the most divine number. Now, the second 